Baruch at Adonai Hamvarak. Blessed is Adonai, the Blessed One. Baruch Adonai Hamvarak Le'olam Vayed. Blessed is Adonai, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Baruch at Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Bachar Banu Mechoh HaAmim, V'netin Lanu Et Torah To, Baruch at Adonai, Noten HaTorah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has selected us from all peoples and gave us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. And as it says in Psalm 119, verse 18, let this be our prayer. Open my eyes that I might behold wondrous things out of your Torah. Now, I remember, oh, a couple years ago, I did a little challenge to myself uh, because there was so much negativity on social media and uh, on Facebook and Twitter and things of this nature. I decided that I would only put a status update that had that that was about thankfulness and gratitude. So I found for about a year, I found at least one thing every single day to be thankful for or to be grateful for. And just that little small act touched the people in my circle that was my friends on Facebook. And they were very appreciative of that positivity. And, and it even challenged them to find gratefulness and thankfulness within their own life. Because it's we're, we're fallen people. We're, we're prone and bent towards negativity. It's so easy to find what's wrong with things instead of what's right. So it is a challenge to our fallen nature to rise above that and to be grateful. And uh, as also a few years ago, I saw a pretty disgusting uh, uh, video about a young man who just turned 16. And um, apparently he was uh, an entitled, spoiled little brat because his parents thought, well, he's 16, let's get him a car. But instead of buying a brand new car, they got a used car that he can kind of fix up, just a simple car to get him to point A to point B. When he saw it, he thought it was a joke. And when he found out it was serious, he just got so mad and was kicking and screaming and just complaining and crying and pitching a fit like he was two years old. I mean, if I was 16 and got a used car, I would just be so excited. You know, as long as it ran, I would be happy. I mean, I'd, I wouldn't really care what it looked like or what model or make or year or brand it was or what have you. But it just really shows how ungrateful we as human beings can be. And that's kind of the theme, among other themes, of this Torah portion called Chukat, which means regulations. Now, Chukat is that same word we learned about a few weeks ago, uh, huk or hukim, which means regulations. Uh, it's one of the, it's those laws that has no logical explanation to it. It's just a law. Uh, so God in his infinite wisdom uh, gives a law, although we don't understand why. And this part of this Torah portion deals with the ashes of the red heifer. And that is such a mysterious thing that even rabbis today are totally stumped over. We can get some a little bit of understanding and meaning and symbology because of the prophecies regarding the Messiah and things of this nature. But ultimately, it's a paradox because the ashes of the red heifer is what cleanses somebody from contamination with a corpse. But yet those who produce it or are involved in making the ashes of the red heifer in the process of making it, they become unclean. <laughs> So what kind of sense does that make? You're unclean if you make the ashes, but if you're sprinkled by the ashes, you're clean? So the best analogy I can come up with to give a very simple explanation, and that's why I'm speeding through this because that's not the focus of our, of our uh, sermon today, is that think of a sponge. Now, if you had a spill on the floor, that sponge would absorb that spill. But yet you would be contaminated because once that sponge is filled, it has to leach out what it's been filled with. And because you're touching the sponge and handling the sponge, you would be contaminated by what was in the sponge because you're holding it. So that's kind of the best explanation. But we ultimately know that the red heifer represents the Messiah. Uh, the, the, the red heifer, because the Torah was not written in chronological order. So the ashes of the red heifer is in a very weird place, but there's a reason for that. But really, the ashes of the red heifer was supposed to atone for the sin of the golden calf. Measure for measure, right? Calf for calf, golden calf for red calf. And so even today, you have the Levitical priest that are uh, being trained by the Temple Institute. They're waiting for the time is right to rebuild the temple. Once it's rebuilt, 
you know, they've got all the furnishings uh, reproduced except the Ark, and I think they know where it is, but they're not telling anybody, of course. Uh, but they've been trained in the different rituals, and they're doing mock rituals um, all the time. And so what they're doing now is trying to produce a pure red heifer. So according to rabbinic law and tradition, not two hairs on this red heifer could be a different color. If there's two hairs that are not red, then it disqualifies it from being a pure red heifer. So anyway, that little tidbit there, that's not really what uh, we're going to be dealing with. We're going to be in Numbers chapter 21. Now, the Torah portion is from chapter 19 to 22, but we're going to be dealing with uh, chapter 21, starting uh, with verse 4. Numbers chapter 21, verse 4. They traveled from Mount Hor, which Mount Hor is interesting because in the Hebrew, it's from, it's, uh, they traveled from Mount Mountain. <laughs> so according to what this is, is it, it, it's really a description of the mountain, not necessarily a proper name. It was a mountain on top of a mountain. It was a mountain with a little knoll or peak on the top. So they traveled from Mount Hor along the route of the, Red, the Sea of Reeds in order to go around the land of Edom. Because Esau, which is you know who Edom was, is uh, Esau's descendants. So Edom would not permit the children of Israel to pass through their land. It says, um, <clears throat> they traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Sea of Reeds in order to go around the land of Edom. The spirit of the people became impatient along the way. So it's as if almost that the spirit of the Edomites kind of wafted into the camp of the Israelites and influenced them. Because let's think of who Esau was. Esau was the firstborn. He was an angry, uh, complaining, rebellious, ungrateful person. He considered the birthright worthless and of no value. So he sold it to his brother and then complains later that his brother stole it. He felt entitled to the blessing. And he even blamed uh, uh, you know, uh, Isaac and Jacob for, for that. Uh, when he didn't get his way, he complained and whined and rebelled. And he always thought that murder was a solution. Because you know what? I want to kill my, my brother Jacob and get him back for what he did. So that's kind of the attitude and spirit of Esau. And it permeated the people of Edom. Now, people are very biased when it comes to their own lineage, genealogy, and history. So I'm sure that the Edomites were told from the very beginning... Israel is our enemy. They're the bad guys. They stole our birthright. They stole our blessing. That's why we're having to live out in the desert and eke out a living for ourselves. That's why we have to live from hand to mouth and by warfare is because we didn't have the birthright and the blessing. So when they came from Egypt and they came to the border, they're like, no way, Jose, you're not passing through our land. We don't trust you. Forget that. You know, so, uh, but we see here in verse four that they became impatient. The spirit of the people became impatient along the way. Why were they being impatient? Could it be that because they were so close to the border of Edom that that spirit that permeates Edom was, was having some sort of negative influence on them? And then in verse 10, it says, B'nai Israel, which means the children of Israel, moved on and encamped at Oboth. Now, Oboth comes from the word which means spirits or ghosts. So Oboth was thought to be inhabited by evil spirits of the dead giants, of the dead Nephilim kings. So we see here that the children of Israel lodged between ingratitude and witchcraft. A dangerous place to camp. Which created the perfect storm for what happened in what we're about to read in verses 4 through 9. So verse 5 says, uh, well, let, hang on, let's, let's stick with verse 4. Let's stay there just for a second because in 1 Timothy 6, 6, it says, Godliness, and this is Paul writing to Timothy, Godliness which godliness means keeping his commandments, keeping his word, keeping his instructions, godliness with contentment, being content with your lot, being content with what you have. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So a lot of times when we're ungrateful or we not when we're not content, we feel like we have been gypped. We feel like we've we're at a loss. We feel like we're at a disadvantage. But Paul tells Timothy, godliness with contentment is great gain. And from a prison cell, a rice a, a lice rat infested prison cell, in Philippians 4:11, Paul writes, "For whatever circumstance I am in." And and Paul had seen it all. 
He was an affluent Pharisee. He was taught by the famous Gamaliel, Rabbi Gamaliel, Gamaliel who's quoted in the Talmud, which is the compendium of, of Jewish commentary of law and regulations. He's still a well-known, famous rabbi to this very day. Sat at his feet. He was in next in line to be, become part of the Sanhedrin, the, the uh, court of Israel. So he was very, very wealthy, very affluent, very educated. He was a Roman citizen, which most people had to buy their citizenship, was, which was expensive. He was highly educated. He could converse with the philosophers on Mars Hill. So he knew the heights of being a socialite. They also knew the, the dregs of society and being at the lowest point, being in a prison cell, having his back tore open and whipped, being in stocks and chains. So he says, whatever circumstance I am in, I have learned. So in other words, it's a process. It's not just something that comes to you. I've learned to be content. Whatever circumstance I am in, I've learned to be content. So verse 5 says, the people spoke against God and Moses. Now, we're here at the very end of the 40-year wanderings in the desert. We only get a record of the first two years after they left Egypt and then the 39th, 40th year of the journey. So those years in between has not been recorded. They just walked around for that time, moving from place to place, camp to camp, living everyday life, drawing water from wells, you know, harvesting the manna, getting whatever local things grew around the camp, slaughtering their animals for food, making sacrifices at the tabernacle, just living the everyday life, chopping wood, building fires, whatever. So it's, I think it's interesting that that's kind of, it's silent between those two periods. So we're here at the very end where pretty much all of the other generation had died except for Moses, Joshua, and Caleb, pretty much as the only ones who are left. So this next generation is who the people are. The people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us from Egypt to die in the wilderness? Because there is no bread or water, and our very spirits detest this despicable food. Exodus twenty two twenty seven says, do not, uh, do not despise God. In other words, blame God for everything. Do not despise God or curse a ruler of your people. You dance with the one who brung you, as the saying goes. You know, you're loyal to who God has placed you with and called you to. Not saying that leaders will always do everything right. They won't because we're fallible people. But it says here the people spoke against God, and God is all loving, all compassionate. He's holy. But they spoke against God and against Moses, which was God's right-hand man for the children of Israel. Why have you brought us from Egypt to die in the wilderness? Because there is no bread, no water, and our very spirits detest the despicable food. They are camped between Edom and Oboth, between ingratitude and witchcraft. And there is a connection between the two. When you reject or speak against God's leaders for you, you speak against God. 1 Samuel 8, 7 says, for they have, God is telling Samuel, for they have not rejected you. Rather, they have rejected me from being their king over them. Now, what is this despicable food that they're talking about? The manna! How dare them! Manna was a miraculous food. They said that it was it was it, it tasted like honey cakes. So that's like telling a kid you can eat cotton candy all day if you want. You can eat ice cream all day if you want. You can have junk food. That's almost kind of like what it's saying. And they're saying, no, this manna is despicable. Manna was called heaven's bread or heavenly bread. It was called angel's food. And yet they are. I mean, talk about looking a gift horse in the mouth. Talk about ingratitude. How ungrateful can you be when you are literally miraculously being fed day after day? Now, you have the secular scholars says, well, there's no way that millions and millions of people could survive out in the desert for 40 years. Well, you know what? They're right. But God made it happen because of miracles. There was water from rocks. Bitter springs turned sweet. There was quail. And then there was manna. Miraculously prov providing for millions of people. And they gathered this manna in a measure of omer. And an omer is a measurement, but the, it's closely related to another Hebrew word that implies a word. 
So that's kind of where we get our daily bread and God's word being our daily bread, where that connection between bread and word come together. So it implies their daily bread, their, their daily provision from God. So they basically said that the manna is like dirt. And in Genesis, the serpent is cursed to eat dirt. So that is why they were punished by the bite of the serpent, by the bite of the snake. See the connection there? They're like, this is despicable food. It's as if we're eating dirt. Well, the heck, we're picking it up off the ground. It's right next to the dirt. We're tired. We're sick of this. And so the serpent was cursed to eat dirt the rest of his life, according to Genesis chapter 3. So God sent the snakes in to bite them. So here we go to verse 6 and we get right into the story. So Adonai sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. So God punishes measure for measure. You know, he, he has the punishment to fit the crime. Now, poisonous serpent in other translations is fiery serpents. And it comes from the word seraph, which seraph, you'll remember there's a word called seraphim, which a seraphim is a type of heavenly being that has six wings. Now, also seraph and, and nakash, so nakash is the word serpent and seraph is fiery. So seraph nakash or nakash seraph is fiery serpent. So it's implying that this serpent was bronze in color, had bronze colored scales. And did you know that there is a snake that inhabits that reg region that would fit the bill for this serpent? And this, this serpent even has wings. It's called the cobra. So when a cobra is intimidated or trying to look big, it will fan out the sides, its sides, and they are called wings. So you have this uh, seraph nakash, this nakash seraph, this fiery serpent. It not only fiery because of the color of the skin, but fiery also because of the venom, because it said when you get bit by a poisonous snake, it feels like there's fire flowing through your veins. It burns. It's, that's the nature of the venom. And uh, so I also think it's interesting, too, that they came from a place that worshipped the cobra. The cobra was on the crown of the pharaoh's, the pharaoh's uh, headpiece. And it's also believed that that's what the rod, when the rod was turned into a serpent, that it turned into a cobra or some kind of, you know, something like that. So now you have this connection between the snake and the seraph. We all know about the four living creatures, the four heavenly beings. You know, one has the face of a human, one has the face of an ox, one has the face of an eagle. They are constantly before God's throne and they're proclaiming holy, holy, holy. You had Ezekiel that, that, that uh, uh, had the vision about them with, one, with two sets of wings they flew, with one, two set, uh, one, sets of wing, one set of wings they flew, one set of wings they covered their face, and one set of wings they covered their feet. You also have the same uh, imagery show up in the book of Revelation. But it's believed by a lot of scholars and rabbis and sages that instead of four living creatures, there was originally five. And that the serpent was among these living creatures. So you had the human, the ox, the lion, and the eagle. But also the fifth would be the serpent. That represents, that represents Lucifer. That re represents Hallel, which was Lucifer's Hebrew name. And of course, he fell and was kicked out of heaven. So he was a throne guardian of God. He was the praise and worship leader of heaven, and because of his rebellion, wanting to be as God and raise himself above God's throne and rule all the angelic host, in the rebellion, he was booted out. So the five living creatures became four, and each creature represents an earthly domain. So you have the face of the human, which re represents humans, obviously. You have the ox, which represents domesticated animals. You have the lion, which represents uh, the, the wild beasts. And then you have the eagle, which represents uh, the, the, uh, the birds. But you're missing the serpent, which represents all the reptiles. But you're all, also missing sea creatures because heaven was thought to represent the ocean because what's, whatever is in the ocean is mirrored on the earth. So you have a, a lobster, which is mirrored by the scorpion. You have a crab, which is mirrored by the spider, what have you. But uh, a lot of the scripture talks about God's throne being above the waters, because before the flood, there was a water canopy that surrounded the earth, 
And it was believed that God's throne was ab above this water canopy. And that's why when, when the children of Israel, uh, the leaders of Israel and Moses saw God in his throne room, it says that the throne room floor was as sapphire. Sapphire is blue like the ocean. So I think it's very interesting. Um, so the fiery serpent represents Satan, the father of rebellion and the fall, the discontented, the, the ingracious angel of God who wasn't content with his, with, with his place and always wanted more. And so it totally reflects what the children of Israel, they weren't content with, with their lot. They weren't content with where they were at and what they were given. They constantly wanted something different and they wanted something more. We also seen these other rebellions in the past Torah portions where some of the Levites weren't content with carrying the ark. They wanted to be the high priest as well. Things like this. So this contentment uh, is an issue here. Perhaps because the word for fiery serpent also alludes to not just their venom, which burns in the veins like fire, but perhaps because of their copper colored scales. Uh, so it's basically the Middle East version of a copperhead, I guess you, would, you could say. So it's interesting, too, that you have venom, which kills, but anti-venom, which is made from the venom that heals. And so you kind of get an analogy of that red heifer again, where, you know, if you're making the concoction, you're impure, but if you're sprinkled by it, you're pure. So you kind of see that analogy and stuff here. So in verses 7 through 9, it says, The people came to Moses and said, We sinned. Oh, really? What gave that away? <laughs> we sinned. When we spoke against Adonai and you, pray to Adonai for us that he may take away the snakes. So Moses prayed for the people. And Adonai said to Moses, make yourself a fiery snake and put it on a pole. There's other translations that says put it on a banner or put it on a standard. So a standard is usually what carried the flag of whatever tribe, clan, or regiment. So it was in the shape of a cross. You had a pole with a crossbar, and that crossbar is what the flag was draped on or the banner was draped on. So literally, you had this snake that Moses was going to make, and it was going to be put on a cross. So Adonai said to Moses, verse 8, make yourself a fiery snake. He didn't tell him to make it out of copper, but he did because the snake had coppery scales. Copper is the color of fire but also copper or brass, some people say, is the, is the metal that symbolizes judgment because you had the brazen altar, the altar that, was that, that, that the sacrifices burned on that atoned for people's sins. That was God's judgment against the sin is what happened to the sacrifice on that bronze altar. So bronze was symbolic of judgment. And a lot of times when we say, we have that saying that, oh, you know, I, I feel like I feel like the, that my prayers aren't getting anywhere. I feel like my prayers are hitting a, a ceiling of brass or the sky is brass. So God's not hearing me and that's his judgment against me because the sky is br So you're seeing all these other things come into play here. Make yourself a fiery snake and put it on a pole. Whenever anyone who is bitten will look at it. And this Hebrew word is not just glance at it and look back away. It means to look intently at it. it means to gaze upon it. Lock your sights on this snake. Whenever anyone who is bitten will look at it, he will live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. And it happened that, whatever the, that whenever the snake bit anyone and he looked at the bronze snake, he lived. So there's something that happens 700 years later from this point. 700 years later, in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 18. Leave it to human beings to always ruin a good thing. So God can create something. God can give us something. And we can take that gift and do great things with it. Or we can take that gift and pervert and do bad things with the very gifts and talents God's given us. So in 2 Kings, chapter 18... Verses 1 through 4, it says, Now it was in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Now Hezekiah was a good king. He was one of the good guys, the very few good kings of Israel and Judah. Verse 2, he was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned for 29 years in Jerusalem. His, his mother's name was Abia, daughter of Zechariah. 
He did what was right in Adonai's eyes, according to all his ancestor David had done. He modeled his rule and reign after David. And it was said of David that he was a man after God's own heart. It says in verse, six, uh, verse 4, he removed the high places and smashed the pillars. The high places were kind of like generic altars that you could offer your sacrifice to any deity you pleased on these high places. They were just generic places of worship. And see, since the temple was built, Solomon had made uh, an agreement with God that the only legitimate place to sacrifice, there'd be no more personal altars, no more high places. The only legitimate place to sacrifice to God is at the temple. So the, so the, the high places become obsolete because in the beginning, everybody had their personal altar. And before the Levites, the high priest was the firstborn son. He removed the high places and smashed the pillars. The pillars were religious phallic symbols of certain deities. You had, you know, uh, the Asherah pole, you had Ashereth, you had Baal, you had all these. And so they were very sexually oriented cults, if you will. So it says he cut down the pillars and cut down the Asherah poles. He also broke into pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For up to those days, B'nai Israel was still burning incense to it and called it Nehush Nehushtan. So they made a God out of it. They made a deity out of it. They took God's mode and gift of salvation and turned it into a religion, turned it into a deity, turned it into a false God, a false mode of worship. So the bronze serpent Moses made became an idol, a God to the people called Nushatan, which was the, uh, which was the consort of the goddess Asherah, also known as Ishtar, also known as Venus. She went by many names. Now, uh, Nehushtan is called the Lord of the Good Tree, which I think is pretty ironic and perverted at the same time. The Lord of the Good Tree. Basically, it's saying that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was the good tree, not the tree of life. The tree of knowledge of good and evil was the good tree. So this is where the modern day uh, cabal, the modern day secret societies draw from, they believe that Satan is the good guy. He is called Lucifer, and Lucifer is the light bearer. God didn't want us to be privy to all the information he knew. He wanted to keep us dumb and stupid in subjection. But thank God Lucifer came along and gave us light. He was the light bearer. He, he, he brought us into these privy secrets that only God knew, and God was just jealous because he didn't want us to know what he knew, right? Didn't Satan say in the garden, you will be as gods, knowing good and evil. You will choose your own destiny. You'll do what you want. So this Lord of the good tree, I think, is related to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this is what the very people who are in the Illuminati today believe and praise. You have Beyonce and you have Jay-Z who praise Lucifer. They have come right out and say that they believe Lucifer is the good guy, that they worship Lucifer, or allude to that at the very least. So you have a lot of these famous people who are into this, this weird mode of worship, worshiping the other with the other team, worshiping the bad guy. Uh, so in Genesis 3.1 is where the serpent kind of got his start, and this word serpent is nakash, which means shining ones. And it alludes to the iridescent scales, kind of likely shown as bronze, like the bronze shining in the sun. So we see all this connection here. Now, it's interesting that the word bronze contains the Hebrew letters for the word serpent. So there's very close connections here. So in Numbers, back to Numbers chapter uh, 21, it says in verse 8, Adonai said to Moses, make yourself a fiery snake and put it on a pole. When, and whenever anyone has been bitten, will look upon it or look at it, he will live. Um, all right. And verse 9. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. And it happened that whenever a snake had bit anyone and he looked at the bronze snake, he lived. And I want to relate that and kind of tie some, some scriptures together to get a broader view and a better understanding. So you have Genesis 3, chapter 14. And this is what we've been talking about. Chapter 3, verse 14 says, And Adonai Elohim, that is the Lord God, said to the serpent, Because you did this, because you, you tricked Adam and Eve, because you did this, 
Cursed are you above all the livestock and above every animal of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put animosity or enmity, the King James says, between you and the woman, between your seed, which is interesting that the serpent has a seed. And I believe this serpent seed was the Nephilim, was the fallen angels cohabitating with the daughters of men, creating these giants, these Nephilim. Between, because the whole goal of the Nephilim was to wipe out a pure human DNA so that the Redeemer wouldn't be able to come and save human beings. <laughs> Between you, between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Wait a second. The woman doesn't have a seed. The woman has eggs. What's this woman's seed? That alludes already to the virgin birth. A woman that's going to conceive without the help of a man. He, the one who comes from the seed of the woman, he will crush your head. And you will crush his heel. And I always think of the spike that pierced Yeshua's feet. That went through his feet into his heel. And to me, that's Satan getting at the Messiah. But ultimately, when Yeshua rose from the dead, that's when the Messiah crushed the heel of the snake or crushed the head of the snake. So going uh, from that chapter or from that passage, we go to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 32. John chapter 12, verse 32 says, And as I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was about to die. So this is Yeshua predicting his death. That as I am lifted up above the earth, and what happened with the bronze serpent? The bronze serpent was put on a cross, and it was lifted above the earth. So what Yeshua is saying is hearkening back to Genesis 3, hearkening back to Numbers chapter 21. This is all tied together. And even in Yeshua's conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, Yeshua also alludes to Numbers 21 in this. He kind of hints about it in John chapter 3, starting with verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And here's the famous verse we all know. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So Yeshua is equating himself with the bronze serpent. Why is that? The serpent is the deceiver. The serpent is the evil one. This seems a little confusing. What's the deal here? Well, there is another passage of scripture that says that Yeshua became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. So the, the symbol of the bronze snake on the pole is symbolizing the sin of Adam and Eve and the deception. So Yeshua is taking that sin and deception upon himself. So he became sin for us. He was, he was sinless, but he took it upon himself as a substitute for us. So that's why you have that illusion of the snake and Yeshua. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent, he's saying that just as the bronze serpent was a symbol of judgment, divine judgment, but also a symbol of divine healing, I'm going to take the judgment of God upon myself to bring about your healing, to bring about your salvation through what I do on the cross. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And then we go on to the letters of Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Here's that passage I was alluding to. He made the one who knew no sin to become a sin offering on our behalf, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's a hymn that I try to find in our hymn book, but of course it's not in there. But uh, there was a, a, another little church that uh, Pam and I attended in Springfield, Tennessee. And this is one of the uh, song leader's favorite songs. It was called Look and Live. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus Christ and live. It's recorded in his word. Hallelujah. If only that you'd look and live, right? So it's, it's that... 
it, it's taken from Numbers chapter 21, that hymn talking about looking, looking, just looking intently, not just looking and looking away, but looking intently and understanding and realizing the symbology and how that applies to your life, realizing what this is really all about. So in Isaiah chapter 14, and for the sake of time, we won't get into that, but that is the rebellion of Satan. That is the rebellion of Lucifer. He was ingracious. He was ungrateful to God for creating him, making him the praise and worship leader of heaven, the leader of the four living creatures. He complained. He wasn't content with his station, and therefore he rebelled. So we see that ingratitude leads to rebellion. So I'm just going to read it. You don't have to turn there because I'm going to be turning to a lot of passages here. But in uh, Proverbs... Here, Proverbs, Proverbs, Proverbs. You ever do that when you're uh, going through the Bible and you're looking for a book and you're like, I know it's there. And when you have a new Bible, you're just trying to find that right place. Okay, so Proverbs chapter 17, verse 13 says this. Um, make sure this is right here. 17, 13. Whoever rewards evil for good, evil will never leave his house. So this is a commentary on ingratitude. When you're ingrateful, you rebel and complain against the one you should be actually be grateful to. And it says that evil will never leave your house. So what happened to the children of Israel? Snakes came in, right? Snakes came in and bit them and they started keeling over and, and dropping like flies and dying. And Paul says in Romans 121, for even though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give him thanks. Indeed, their thinking became futile and their senseless hearts were made dark. So ingratitude brings evil. It opens the door for evil to come into your life and it darkens your heart to be able to even see God and to understand what he's doing in your life and the goodness that he's doing in your life. So the first step is ingratitude, being ungrateful. Next, from ingratitude comes complaining. So in Psalm, Psalm 106, David talks a little bit about, about this. Psalm 106, verse 25 says instead they grumbled in their tents they would not listen to adonai's voice so first comes ingratitude where you're calling good evil and evil good your heart becomes dark you open yourself up to evil coming into your life and and, and evil kind of becoming a punishment upon you you complain and you don't listen to god's voice he's trying to get a hold of you to turn back but you won't listen and then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10.10, 10, And let's not grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroying angel. So he's talking about whenever Israel complained, at one time they were destroyed by an angel. And, you know, Moses had to pray and put a stop to that. So grumbling leads to basically death. Complaining leads to a death sentence. So from ingratitude, you have complaining. From complaining, the next step in that parade is outright rebellion. So for that, I want to uh, read a passage in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. For rebellion... Is like the sin of witchcraft. This translation says divination. For rebellion is equivalent to or the same as witchcraft. And stubbornness, which you get, you become stubborn, you become ingracious and complain, right? And stubbornness is like the iniquity or lawlessness and idolatry. And we see that's exactly what happened. Their ingratitude led to rebellion, and it ended up leading to idolatry because that snake later on that was their salvation became a god in the book of Kings. So complaining, ingratitude, and entitlement 
and rebellion, if left unchecked, can and will lead to the worship of Satan. Sounds crazy, right? Sounds extreme. But we've seen that exact same thing happen with the children of Israel. And it happened kind of instantly in the desert, but it took 700 years for them to literally be worshiping Satan in the guise of this bronze serpent that was originally made to bring about their healing and about their salvation. So I just really wanted to drive the point home of in this day and age where everybody feels entitled and feels they have rights. And, you know, we do. We have some inalienable rights. I agree. But there's some things that we complain about that we just shouldn't complain about. Things that we have no control over. And we should find the good in things. Like, I, I know I've brought this illustration out before, but it's one of the most simplistic ones. You know, you're driving down the road and calls it, and you're like, and you're like, oh man, I just got a flat. You look at your watch, oh man, I'm late for work. You know, you're in your nice dressed clothes for work, and you pull off to the side of the road, stomp out, open up the trunk, and there's a bunch of crap in the trunk. You throw it out on the ground, and you get under that little floor mat in the trunk, and get out this donut that's not big as anything, and the, and you get the jack, and you're busting your knuckles, and it's uh, start to rain, and you're oh, and you're all mad, and you get under, and you start cranking it up, and the car falls a couple times, and you're just wishing somebody would come and help you, and you're just complaining and getting mad the whole time as you're changing that tire. Why me? Why does this have to happen to me? Why, God? What did I do wrong? Why are you punishing me? We're looking at that flat tire as a punishment from God when God has nothing to do. I mean, well, he does, but he's not using it as a punishment. And then you finally, you know, maybe, you know, you, you get some grease on your shirt or whatever. And you're like, oh, I'm going to have to stop at the store and get a new shirt before I go to work. I'm going to be late. Blah, blah. And then you finally get in the car and you're on your way. And then lo and behold, a couple miles up the road, there is a fatal car accident. Thank you, God, for that flat tire. Thank you, Lord, for that flat tire. If it wasn't for that flat tire, that could have been me that had that blanket pulled over my body on the side of the road. Because a tractor trailer lost control and hit somebody head on. So we need to find, even in the most negative places in our life. And you know what? I'm preaching to the choir. Pam's probably sitting over there saying, you know, you're a hypocrite. You complain a lot when things don't go right. <laughs> so, you know, when I'm preaching, I'm not preaching because I'm an expert at it. I'm not preaching because I've achieved what I'm what I've preaching. I'm just preaching because this is the word of God and it's true whether I live it or not. And sometimes I have to do my best to try to live up to, to practice what I preach. And, we all and I need to hear it. Yeah, yeah, and we all need to hear it. And I do try to practice what I preach, but sometimes I'm not so great at it because by nature I'm a pessimist. That's just my outlook. I'm very pessimistic. I'm getting better at it as I get older, but hopefully now that I've kind of let you all know what my little secret is and what my dirty laundry is, maybe it'll help me and remind me that in, when I'm in situations like that to be more thankful, to be more grateful, to look for that silver lining in that dark cloud. Because all things work together for good for them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Corey Ten Boom. I don't know if you guys know who she, who she was, but she was in the Holocaust. She was a believer. And she was in one of those Nazi death camps. And if being in the Holocaust and being in a death camp, being worked to the bone and being starved to death wasn't good enough, all of a sudden her whole barracks gets lice. Talk about rubbing salt in the wound. And they're all wondering why, why is our barracks, why do, we have, why do we have to suffer with this lice? But God, she says, God sent that lice. I'm thankful for that lice because the, light, the lice saved the women of that barracks. Because on a regular basis, the Nazi soldiers would go into any barracks they want and rape any woman they wanted. But they weren't going to touch them. I don't want to get lice. So God protected. He used something negative to bring about something good. And there's a rabbinic story uh, that's told. Uh, Gamzu Latova, which means this is all for the good. That's the Hebrew phrase for this is all for the good, Gamzu Latova. And I don't know if I'm going to tell the story exactly right, but basically this, this, this rabbi, he is uh, traveling from town to town, and he's got this donkey, he's got this rooster, and he's got this lantern. And he goes into this one town, but there's no place for him to stay, so he goes off you know, to the woods a little bit and makes a little camp out there. Well, in the middle of the night, uh, you know, his, uh, his donkey gets scared and runs off. And he's all, great, I don't have any transportation now. And then later on in the middle of the night, there's a fox that comes in and kills the rooster. 
And then so all he has left is this lamp. And the, because of the storm, the wind, wind blows and blows out his lamp. So everything seems to be going wrong. But every time something bad happened, he, he trained himself to say, Gam Zulatova, this too is for the good. Although I don't understand it, this too is for the good. So what he discovered the next day is that a, a warring tribe, somebody that was against the town that he just passed through, invaded that town in the middle of the night and killed everybody and stole everything in that town. And if they heard the donkey bray, they would have came out and found him. In the morning, if they heard the rooster crow, they would have come out and found him and killed him. If they saw the light in the woods, oh, somebody's out there, they would have come out and found him and killed him. But because his donkey died or ran off and because the rooster got killed and because the lamp blew out, God used all of those negative things to save his life because he didn't know until the next day that there was a band of raiders that raided that town he just passed through. Gamzu Latova, this too is for the good. And so we need to train ourselves to, to say that, to overcome these negative situations and to be grateful and thankful because ingratitude leads to complaining. Complaining leads to rebellion. Rebellion is, is as the sin of witchcraft. And what is witchcraft? Satan worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I hate it when I have to <laughs> teach and preach stuff that I'm not good at myself. <laughs> oh... But Lord, maybe you'll use this very sermon to haunt me when I'm tempted to complain and to, to, to be ingrateful and to be negative and to be down on myself. To say, hey, remember what you told the people. Live, practice what you preach. Don't be a hypocrite. So Lord, I pray that you would just bring this to mind and, and help us as we go out throughout our week and throughout our lives. And we come up against these challenging things. Because that's life. It's going, to, it's going to happen. Not a matter of if, but when these trials and tribulations come our way. Help us to find that silver lining in the dark cloud. Help us to be grateful. And even if we're eating the same meal every day, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and ramen noodles, at least we have food in our belly, which is more than most of this world can say. And sometimes we may get sick of eating the same thing over and over, just like the children of Israel got sick of eating that manna day in and day out. You said you would provide for our needs, not necessarily our tastes, not necessarily our druthers, not necessarily our wants. But you said you would provide for our needs, and as long as our needs are met. And Paul says, if you have food and clothes, therewise be content. If you have clothes on your back and food in your belly, be content. You have a right to be discontented if you're naked and hungry. But if you have those basic necessities, you're good. And help us to understand and realize that we have been so spoiled, this generation. We don't know what, our, what it was like for our grandparents who lived through the Great Depression and who had to scrimp and save and scratch and claw to eke out a living. And a lot of times they didn't know where their next meal was coming from. And they had to travel miles and miles for work. And it was dangerous work at that. We've got it so good. Even the poorest among us are living like kings compared to our grandparents and great-grandparents. Even those who are on assisted living and welfare have it so much better than our ancestors did. So, Lord, help us to be grateful. And when we have a heart of gratitude, it'll be easy for us to see your miracles. It'll be easy for us to see your goodness and your holiness, your graciousness, your compassion, your favor towards us. How could the children of Israel not see the favor that you placed upon them? You, you allowed them to survive for 40 years in the desert when by human standards it was impossible. They just got complacent and took your miracles for granted. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We ask these things in Yeshua's name and we close with the ironic benediction. Yevarekaka Adonai Vishmareka. Yeer Adonai Panava Leka Veikuneka. Yesa Adonai Panava Leka Veesem Leka Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Bashem Yeshua Moshenu, in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.